Our speakers uh, this afternoon are Matt Jane. Uh, Matt is an assistant professor of computer science at Allegheny College. Uh, his research is fundamentally human-centered, dealing with the behavior of novice programmers and the design and development of tools to support parallel programming in small and embedded spaces. Uh, Matt is a 1998 graduate of Kenyon College, where he majored in physics. Uh, with his master's degree from Indiana University, mm -hmm. University Bloomington, and his PhD from the University of Kent, both in computer science. Mal Chua is a PhD candidate in engineering education at Purdue University. Uh, over time, Mal has progressed from hacking hardware as an electrical engineer to code as a software developer to hacking organizational cultures in a role which has been called catnip gardener after the, uh, after the job of herding cats. Uh, she's been associated with open source projects included Red Hat, including Red Hat Linux, Fedora, Sugar Labs, One Laptop Per Child, the MIT Media Lab, Design Continuum, Acropedia, and the Open Planning Project. The talk this afternoon is called A Walk in the Commons, Open Source and the Local Arts. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It was much better, actually, than the introduction I was going to do, so I won't do one. <laughs> um, we have an outline for a talk that is almost certainly too long, and so we will do our best um, not to go too long. That's, that's exactly what you don't want to say when you start a talk. Mel and I, however, are on opposite sides of the fine state that we reside in the near center of. And so we've only had the opportunity to work on this at a distance. And there comes a point where face-to-face -face interaction is valuable. Mm -hmm. So we'll be talking about open communities. These are, well, that's what the rest of the talk is for. What kind of opportunities these represent for learners. Those could, for example, involve some of you in the classroom, even those of you with higher degrees. Uh, value, the value proposition for the learner, some case study opportunities, as well as a chance for us to talk a little bit. That's exactly where the timing for the talk goes completely out the window. Uh, challenges that you will likely face as an educator and or as a participant in these kind of projects. The opportunities if you're interested in research, both just as a researcher in your own area of specialty, as well as opportunities for research in these kind of communities, and then opportunities for us as educators. So we'll start with one definition of what an open community might be. And I'm going to say that that could be a distributed group of volunteers who are committed to giving away their efforts. Actually, it's got some red words in it. Um, but that describes a lot of communities. That, that could describe any kind of the United Way. It's a group of volunteers who are distributed who are committed to giving away their efforts. So when we talk about open communities, we do mean something just a little bit more or different. And this is the open source way. It's the kind of practice that whether it's a content project, a hardware, software project, any effort, this is the culture that they practice. Cross-functional is, is not just the core thing that they make transparent, but it's their governance, it's their marketing, it's their legal work, it's their finance, it's everything. So Cross-functional. Everybody communicates and makes it from the ground up and says a hierarchy of a top down and there's real time transparency. So as things are getting made, they are immediately seen by anyone who wants to participate in the project. And there's not many words there, but as I've learned through my own practice, this this is different than what we often do. So what are some example projects? The Firefox project is one that I assume that you're probably familiar with. Um, Firefox project was developed in uh, ships in, I, I think, 37 or 38 languages at the moment. Um, well over 30 million downloads a year. It has millions of lines of code in at least four different programming languages. Um, it's a non-trivially large project. The Wikipedia, another open community of collaborators. And of course, it's one that as academics uh, depends on your discipline. Some of us like to deride it. Some, uh, some, of it you know, some of us say, wow, there's actually excellent resources there. The Wikiotics project is basically an open Rosetta Stone project for language learning. CivX is a community of collaborators working to improve the kind of tools we have for governance at the local level and up. There's a lot of data that's available to us today and how do we use that data to make better decisions about the governance of our local communities. FreeCiv 
Uh, one of my roommates would often waste valuable time that he could have been using to do physics. However, unlike me, he was able to do physics faster, so he had this time, I guess. Um, FreeSiv is an open source implementation of a popular series of video games, which was once a board game called Civilization. And the Sahana project actually is a really fascinating project coming out of the 2005 Sri Lankan uh, tsunami disasters. The techno technology community came together and said, in the wake of this disaster, we had no idea what to do. And so, in terms of first response for large scale disasters, the Sahana project was born as a way to manage and uh, coordinate finding people recording where bodies are found, relief efforts in terms of materials, food supplies, medical supplies. And so over the years it has grown significantly and is now deployed in these kind of emergency situations almost immediately. There's a complete infrastructure that when something bad happens, you essentially can push a button and have a Sahana instance ready to support on the ground relief efforts. It's an absolutely incredible example of what happens when a distributed community of committed volunteers come together. So all these pieces of software have four fundamental freedoms that allow people to participate in the um, under the license that the, the freedom to use the freedom to download and to use the program for yourself for any purpose. You also have the freedom to turn it. So unlike free will, it's also free to use. Free software and open source software and open community content have access to the source code or the equivalent and the tools you need to modify that source code. So you can take it and you can tweak it and you can turn it instead of having to go back to the original makers and hope that they might like your idea. You have the freedom to share it because your friends also have the freedom to use it. And also, most importantly, you have the freedom to share your changes. So if you have a good idea, you can get that out to other people and they don't have to be in that video. Well, what can your students do? Um, they can lurk and watch and listen. There's not actually, if you think about it, you know, we try and get our students into internships, but that's hard to do. And so the opportunities for them to see a professional community of practice in action is something that can be difficult, but in open communities you can say, you know, for example, as a computer science educator, I can say, here's the Firefox product, go join their developer mailing list. Look at how professional developers talk to each other. Sometimes they do. Um, if you're in the modern languages, you can join the translation list for the Firefox project and say, how is a large translation effort managed? How is it that a piece of software ships every six months with 37 different languages in translation? You can use an experiment the software on the software, and you can instrument it to conduct experiments. If you want to know more about how people use Firefox, we can add the code that we need to actually do that experiment. Or we might be able to find people in the community who want to help us do that work. We can seek out tips, we can seek out tweaks and advice. That is, there are people who are expert with these tools. Um, they provide opportunities for collaboration. And we try and do that within our classrooms, but there's always this in a bottle or echo chamber effect. And so being able to put your students into a space where there are lots of people taking part can be valuable and contributing to driving change forward. Um, and being able to do that both in that community and also in the safety of the classroom where you have your professors standing up to you, helping you analyze your stuff. Because when you usually go into an internship, you don't have a faculty member to check in with every afternoon that says, you know, this discussion was actually not the best way to do it. They could have applied this technique that we discussed in class last semester. And you know, in many real world contexts, you don't have that. But we're in open communities, you can bridge both those worlds, have everybody looking at the screen and say, Let's go line by line through these meeting minutes of the governing board of this project and see whether they were actually effective in the decision making. Okay. I, I haven't done it. Now that we talk about that, well, yes. I was going to say I'm teaching a class right now as a freshman seminar titled Creativity and Leadership. And I wish I had done that exercise this term. Now we're just reading Getting to Yes, which is a classic text on negotiation. So there still might be time to bring in a short set of meeting notes, read them as a class, Say, well, where did this come from? Actually, it came from a project and a group meeting that took place last week. And the people from this in this meeting were from seven different countries. Um, 
That's not something I can do with the Board of Governors at Microsoft. Sounds like I'm thinking about that. Elect them or not? So, what this means is that open communities are full of opportunities for legitimate political participation. The students, no matter how knowledge level they are, no matter how small the scope they have, they have ways that they can participate that are not just tolerated, but actually validated and embraced by the core people in these projects. So, not you know, to let it get a student ghetto of toy project somewhere, it's just actual real stuff. This is the point. Oh. Yeah, and, and, and in terms of liberal arts contributions, these projects are full of engineer technical people, so they're actually desperate for liberal arts type people that have knowledge to do more broader, higher level strategic thinking, cross disciplinary communication, all these kinds of things. That, People who write lots of code don't necessarily have much of the background in. And I, I wanted to make a sort of point about this kind of um, activity for students to bridge communities. Uh, I've learned that it's often that these large communities do not have smooth gateways in. That, and it's not because they're offensive people, um, but it's because they're busy people. And so it's very easy for students to get involved in ways that they actually develop materials or help contribute to conversations where they're able to bring people, guide people into a community, uh, which is a, a really, perhaps in some ways, one of the more valuable contributions that can be made. So the claim that we're making is that in a technological world, with the large students can really become experts. Even if it seems like the project, you know, an institution that does not have a computer science program, for example, that it doesn't matter if you're in chemistry, there are lots of open source programs that are used in chemistry. And that how do you get new models to put into those, or how do you get support for new analyses built into the software? It might not be that your students are able to write the code to do it, but they might be able to do the research that lays the groundwork for that to take place, and that by submitting bug reports that contain the outline of how it should be done, that somebody then might say, oh, that's great, I didn't know how to write that, but now I can. Or, uh, yeah, um, so at some level, I will be brief with these boys because each deserves, I think, a lot of time and thought. So, and there's some claims here. To a certain extent, this is situated authentic learning. You're placing your students into a community of practice. There's a little bit of artificiality here because they're still part of a classroom. And a classroom is not authentic learning. But this is, in some ways, a really nice way for me to bridge the world of the real and the artificial. Uh, they become surrounded by uh, self-directed makers, people who are doing stuff, who want to do stuff, who value contribution and energy. In academia, if I don't have my idea worked out, fleshed out, prepared for all of the objections that my provost is going to have, and I'm sure that it aligns with institutional objectives, and I have ideas for external support, and perhaps even initial indications that I'll get it. It's likely if I go in, the answer will be, uh, I don't really understand what you're talking about. No. Maybe not. I'm not trying to disparage my provost, but my point is, is that in <laughs> academic culture, we don't value ideas being thrown against the wall all day long. In fact, we wish those meetings would be shorter. <laughs> if you know it's really like throwing ideas against the wall, you have lots of them. You don't need to ask permission. The, the currency is desire and energy. You have a community, a community of educators. The volunteers want more people in their project. And once you show the energy and desire and you show persistence, and that's, that's important, people start to invest back in you. You're joining the community of practice. <coughs> and two things here that we didn't have on the slide that we thought were important was these projects become portfolio building. That is, there's a URL out there that you can point to and say, you see this? This is evidence of the work I did. So when you're applying for jobs, it's not just, yeah, I did this stuff at this company. It's that I did this stuff at this project over here, and here's the URL to show that I did it. Uh, in addition, no one knows that you are, pick your age. I, the first workshop I went to that Mel and other colleagues at Red Hat ran, uh, we, part of that workshop, we learned how software gets bundled up to be shipped with those automatic updates that you get. It's tricky. 
It, it is really tricky. Uh, and we got to work with two experts in this space. One of them was uh, Professor Chris Tyler at the uh, at Seneca up in Toronto, who had literally wrote the book on this. The other was Ian Weller. Ian was 17, looking at colleges. Ian was a smart kid. <laughs> <laughs> it's always wonderful to be humbled that way. <laughs> like, <wow. laughs> and and so it, and it was really just marvelous. And he was great. And he really was an expert in the space. Online, nobody knows who Ian Waller is except that he's an expert. Uh, likewise, the most recent work. Yeah, I could go on. It's a really powerful thing. So I'm uh, trying to bring this into more concrete stuff. It's audience participation time. So we want to uh, ask you to take a minute, um, about the clock, to think about, if you don't have anything else in mind, think about a hypothetical theory of physics major, you don't have Or math, or chemistry. <laughs> or, um, you know, insert Psychology. your, uh, insert your discipline here. And think about what kinds of things they might do during the course of a semester or a year that might incorporate participation in some of these open communities. And don't think about it in your head. Go ahead and talk to the people around you. So take a minute or two and brainstorm. What are some ideas that we could use? And then let's share a few of them, and we'll put them on the board we can reach. Oh, awesome. We can reach this board. So go ahead. We can turn the lights on. Now. So let's go ahead and throw. So now let's, you know, there's no, there's no, this is, this is so important. There's no judgment here. It's a judgment-free board. Right? There, there are ideas that are going to go on this board, and they're all good. Doesn't mean we're going to execute on all of them, but they're all good. So what kind of ideas do we come up with? So what about over here? Yeah. Make SAGE so good that it would overtake, you know, all <laughs> mathematical software. And of course, all kinds of people, you know, math undergraduates can certainly contribute to it. All right? You know about Sage, right? What's Sage? <laughs> right. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. yeah. Open source is a Right. That's what it's like. Open ah, source. excellent. Yeah. That clears it up for all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Mathematic is a tool that um, helps enable various kinds of computational approaches to solving mathematical problems. Yeah. That's a very expensive program. It's very expensive. And of course, there it's are very expensive. <laughs> there are others like mathematics, you know, mathematics, you know, they they make all MATLAB, MAGMA, you know. Uh, so in your own disciplines, what's a very expensive software package that there are sort of free or open variants of that are almost there but not quite? Can you think of any? Well, it's open office. SAS and R. Open office, SAS R. as opposed to R. Library catalogs. Mm -hmm. Library catalogs. But those are all ugly anyway, so it doesn't matter whether it costs money. Uh, you or not. could not, you could, you could not make the library catalog look worse. Yeah. It's true everywhere. I don't know. We can turn the blink on like Windows. Windows and Linux. Yeah. Our operating yeah. systems come in different ways. Yep, Ubuntu. Um, all right. So, good. So we've got software that gets used in mathematics. What are they? Um, students can participate in open data projects. Um, open data. We, we talked about one in particular uh, at Kenyon where there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, but some of this is laboratory data that's going to be collected, archived, and made public. Um, and then we talked about the fact that then that you might have a, an outreach and marketing uh, chunk to convince other departments to also participate in that project. And then there's the actual work of making the software work the way that the discipline needs to work. I really like that idea. The idea that there's a discipline representative that, that says, I'm a librarian and I do a lot of other things, but I will participate. And so I don't know how the anthropology department would prefer to see their data. But if I have students from that department that are helping me determine how it looks or working with the professor and things like that, I think that's a huge part of it. And even we discussed some students even reaching into the display interface for these days. So it like you said, it goes like I said, it goes for much different levels. I 
I don't know if you know, but eggheads write your software and they don't know or care what you think in general. Unless you tell them. <laughs> Say that is I'm putting that on myself. So yeah, putting students out there and having them having them work in this case with you to say, how is this, how is this useful? Okay. And that's a really wonderful reflective thing for, for an undergraduate to engage in. What else? Yeah, just working fun and here, I thought Well, we talked uh, a bit about some of the obvious things, like uh, contributing to, uh, to editing various wikis, including including Wikipedia. Um, uh, one idea that, that we had Um, uh, a friend of mine um, speaks German and edits Wikipedia, and sometimes you can do this by simply finding the article in German, the German Wikipedia that's much better and more complete than the one in English. And so then, then translating the relevant passages and, uh, and, and contributing to this, uh, to this uh, open source resource. This morning on the breakfast, we were talking about cultural mediation. Sometimes there are developers from different countries, different continents, different languages and cultures. And even if they can get literal translations of what the other person, you know, America and Argentina say, the culture might be sufficiently different than someone coming in and saying, the way they set up hierarchy and the way they show respect to authority here is different. Therefore, they very dissimilar way and really find a little funny. How to smooth things out considerably. In the Ecuador community, there was, there was there was I remember at one point tension between things in Brazilian Portuguese and Spanish Portuguese oh, and <laughs> language tensions, language and culture. It had nothing to do with the technical aspects of the project, but fascinating or international flame war. I don't it's, know. It's it. not a, it's not a minor issue. No, it's a huge issue. Not at all. It's a big issue. Other yeah. ideas? You guys are all talking. I like this. Too. I'm just curious about what you were talking about. Would they document that? Do they, do they have some sort of... Yeah. And they document everything. Well, it's all online. Well, <laughs> so it's like it's because you have to do that with different communities. Like, the communication takes place online. Mailing us, chat. And so there are archives of mailing us that are public accessible. And there are lots of these chats. So if you wanted to go back and look through them, you can. So somebody who's doing like a sociology course could... Yeah, exactly. So a bunch of anthropologists and researchers and open source communities who are exactly that way. Mining and that. I'll start handing off the back. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I was talking about, I guess it goes back to this open data source. Uh, you know, sometimes I teach a course in um, approaches to the study of religion, and I, I'm always hoping I could find like, like a bunch of case studies, like raw case study ethnography, that we could like apply certain um, theoretical approaches to that the students could could I would just you know give them this stuff and you know what do you make of it from the perspective of these theories that we have just been studying and I, I think that will be great. I don't know, maybe I'd write a grant. It's sounds that's something we should do. <laughs> for the for the for those of us who are not in religious studies, what would what would be an example of some, what would a sort of a raw ethnography look like? Um, I mean, what, people could Put up their notebooks. I mean, their field notes. You know, and uh, you know, without giving their interpretive gloss of what they think this means, but but more descriptive data of what was observed at particular places and particular times. So, if I was, I'm thinking of friends and colleagues I've had work they've done. For example, if they were studying a Jewish community center and they were taking notes on its role in the community that before they added their interpretation, they might put yes. their notes up. Yes. Before they analyzed the data, they just put the notes up. Oh, I mean, I was thinking in terms of um, uh, senior, um, senior projects uh, also, you know, like one of the things that we ask our students to do is to apply um, theories and methods to the study of, of particular stuff. But it's kind of hard to find raw data that they will produce themselves in one of the places to study. If you're willing to step out of, outside of uh, religions of the natural and into religions of the artificial, okay. <laughs> there are a lot of religions in computing. 
<laughs> Windows versus Linux. Like, and we, we do get passionate <laughs> about our other <laughs> <laughs> Emacs versus DI. And in computer science education, we talk about the first programming language holy wars. Right? What language do you teach students first? Which language do we teach here? C++. What? <laughs> it's supposed to Java, right? What? I mean, it's, and so actually you can, in that regard, so I don't know if I could get you this, but I can get you community A and community B. Who have passion. Yeah, I mean, they, can also, they can also study like, uh, you know, there are a lot of religious communities online and, and religious yeah. people have their stuff up there. So they can use that. I think they're not sitting on us. show Friends has done wonders around the world for the development of the American English accent. And I read an article just a few days ago about call centers and how a number of them are moving to the Philippines, that although they cost more, because there is a much stronger culture in, uh, in terms of the learning of American English, and that Friends is actually part of the culture in terms of what people watch, that the accent is much closer to an, Amer it's, is an American English accent as opposed to, say, in India, where they use friends as part of the training materials, but is not part of the culture that they watch. Do they answer the phone, how do you do it? Exactly. No kidding. no kidding. I mean, my own research involves collaborations with collaborators in the Philippines. They speak American English. And so, that, in some, I'm sorry, for my purposes, it's not even here nor there, but, you know, and then reading that article going, oh yeah, that's right. Did it speak American English? And so they've decided it's far cheaper. This has nothing to do with open, but it's far cheaper in terms of support quality because there's no um, cultural differences that emerge through a language. Oh, um, and side note on that, in terms of, we talked about looking before, this might be a way for students that are going to go abroad to listen into what it's like to have conversations in the, in the language of the country they're going to. Like, I'm learning German right now. I'm looking at a half a space in Berlin. <laughs> to see what it's like when people are speaking German talk about technical things that listen to them. You throw them out of English words. Yeah. <laughs> so, what? go ahead. I mean, what I was going to say is the traditional way that we give a talk is that we would right now be panicking that we're not going to get through all the, co the content that's essential. And I'm going to not do that. Uh, we may flip through a few of the slides and let you ask. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that and we'll say a few more words. But I'm going to let the discussion continue because I think the discussion is, yeah. is valuable and it's not necessarily more valuable than the lecture in the original lecture. That's true. Rather than thinking about topics, I was thinking about platforms and thinking about how the Android phone is a relatively open platform and the translation of so much of what we already do to a mobile environment that makes it much easier, it makes us not have a computer. 
And in this regard, I think um, there's going to be, um, I, I, I just thought of a development opportunity, um, but I was saying earlier in, in conversation some comments on colleagues here in physics, that I believe my mobile phone is more powerful than Cray supercomputers from the early 80s. And so what does it mean when every student uh, that has a vector processor and is running a dual core at one gigahertz, it might be more powerful than a Cray one. Yeah. Um, what does it mean that I carry so much power and so much storage in my pocket when I walk into the laboratory? Why is it I have to invest in desktops everywhere? But the software isn't there. So I can't walk in and trust that device to be useful. In fact, it's so funny, it's going to crash, and I wouldn't trust it anyway. But that's, they're all opportunities. Uh, I was thinking about putting that on the I lost the clicker. I found the clicker. And as you see things, feel free to, this is what we came up with for the hypothetical physics major. Which yeah. articles? Um, <laughs> and so, so we'll leave these here and we'll capture them later. Um, part of the, I think just to walk, take away from that is that when we, when we stop thinking about all of this in terms of code, we start thinking about it in terms of culture that it opens up the doors for us to really approach how we might bring students into these spaces. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Just a few words, yeah, a few words about, uh, to, be, to be fair, so I've been, um, I got to know Mel because I spent one year visiting an old college, several of them, several of the students there, Mel graduated before I visited, but when Mel was, oh, you know, Matt, is this new ah. here? There are only 30 faculty there, so you know, like, oh, beat this new, you know, it's, there's only one. Um, but that next summer, I had the opportunity to take part in a workshop that I was, was leading at Red Hat, and have been, been working with a community of educators around the U.S. and, in fact, around the world, as we discuss and put into practice some of these ideas in terms of bringing these ideas into the classroom. It's hard. Uh, sorry, it's different. Um, you have to give up control in some ways. You have to give up weight control in ways that, that at times will impact teaching evaluations. Um, for those of us who are pre-tenured, that might matter. Um, but it is different. That open practice and getting your students to engage in that open culture and see what it means to engage and deal with the delays. And, um, it can be challenging. Transparency can be hard, especially in some cases for us, we're just not used to working in the open all the time. There can be technological tools. If you engage in the community, you need to learn how to edit a wiki. If you engage in the community, you need to learn to use source control. You feel check code out of a repository. Are there any words in that sense I used that you weren't familiar with? If there were, then you need to learn what those words mean. And once you learn that, you need to learn to use the tools. And so you go and ask for help from the community, and they say, oh, yeah, oh, well, then, oh, if, here, open up VI. What's VI? <laughs> oh, here, type this command. OK, so now what you need, and um, the word we use is yak shaving. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like a blanket so I can go to sleep and be warm. Well, to do that, I, I need fabric. To, need, to do that, I need fiber to weave. So I need. I need a yak, <laughs> and I need to shave it. And in computing, we're really good at yak shaving. So your, your students will go in, and I saw this happen. In fact, somewhere online is, a, is actually my meta-analysis of a communication between a student and an open source uh, project member as they took a first-year student in a seminar titled Technology and Activism who had no experience with computing and explained to them Secure protocols and how to check out code. And it was, it was so sad. <laughs> not, not sad in, in, from like, I'm not convinced, not at all about the student. It was just, you watched it and you thought, this, this student is going to walk away with some, the experience they're having is not the experience I want. But at the same time, because I'm in the loop, there was this excellent learning opportunity where I said, you are interacting with an expert. They've taken you down a path that they go down every day. Right? And so the student was able to see, maybe not fully appreciate, but the point was. <laughs> um, and the reason that happens is because these communities are so full of stuff that I could people that have their own projects in mind and know where they want to go, 
So you would see people coming and saying, I would like to do this, and then saying, all right, we assume your goal is great, we'll have to get there, but when a student comes in, not having contact, and say, I'd like to shoot myself in the foot today, please. They go, oh yeah, we take a note. Wait, are you sure that's what you want to do? <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it was awesome. It really was awesome. <laughs> um, and I say that because maybe what I'm saying Maybe what I'm saying is that I know I've probably done that with my own students without realizing it. And so to get to see it happen and say, you know what, I'll bet as an instructor I've done that before. Um, so it was a, maybe it was also I'm just reflecting on my own. I once heard that referred to as reaching the summit over the bodies of your students. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I aspire not to do it, but I'm sure I can. Um, communities aren't used to academia. We work on a fixed cycle. Weeks, we do a project we'd like to be graded at a certain time. Projects, these contributors are working on a different time scale. They ship in October. They skip if they're slipped their, their their release date. You expect them to do something that lined up with it. Hmm. And that, um, and, and I forget what we meant by too helpful. Is that the <laughs> that's the example? <laughs> um, Mel is trying to do this. You want to say anything about it? Uh, basically, there, there's some debate over whether can I actually be radically transparent and still publish and not have everybody see my work and still, you know. Uh, so check back with me <laughs> in a few years and I'll let you know because this is the thesis that I'm going to my academic career in. <laughs> so there was some, just wanted to plot a couple of areas that people are doing active research, in many cases the dissertation or the main value of research. Um, ethics of tackle communities, how Wikipedia becomes a learning resource, the economics of these projects, why do people contribute, this is bizarre, is it a gift culture, does it break out of traditional models, does it not have a debate, semantic web, you know, communities of practice with the sociology, anthropology, I can still not name the papers and researchers of people from these fields or other fields that are interested, um, but those feed up the questions. Um, just as a, a very, very brief note, um, one of the students I'm mentoring this semester, this year in the Senior Capstone Project, uh, he wanted to turn the camera back on faculty in terms of looking at computer science education and say, what takes place as, from the with respect to the instructor and how does that map to uh, cognitive levels of learning? So instead of looking at the student and looking at their exams and trying to categorize them and saying, wow, they're using a really high level of abstraction there, and it's day two. Um, he wasn't able to actually collect any of that data at our home institution. That is, uh, in, in terms of finding source data in a timely way, nobody was ready to let him come in with a camera. But, but Professor Brian Harvey at UC um, Berkeley has all of his lectures online in HD, and they are Creative Commons license. So an entire introductory course of computer science is online, and Zach can do an entire video tagging protocol looking at a well-known computer science educator delivering lecture style content, which is what he wanted. From a video protocol perspective, it is uncommon for video product tagging protocols to include their source data, going back to that, where do you get the case study? Right? Typically, there are so many IRB layers between your data and the publication that it can't go out. Here, he can do URLs directly into the source videos as he writes up his research. And that's kind of cool. So really the tough part is letting go. There's a lot of things here where our practice changes. Uh, and I find, uh, personally I just dive in and I, I make mistakes and I say, wow. That was a mistake. <laughs> and then I learned, and I do better. I mean, I think hard about it, but you still make mistakes. But there are transformations to your practice that happen when you start to bring the rest of the world into the practice. Wow, there's a sequence here of me. See, I'm the age one. Um, so we learn, we watch. Uh, this is from the faculty's perspective, though. We have to become learners again. It is humbling at times. You walk into these communities, we're no longer an expert. Um, you do need to transform your practice. You need to seek out help in public. And I have made mistakes in public, not 
embarrassing ones, but I've gone in and said, I can't get this to work. And then somebody says, well, blah, blah, blah. And I said, oops, I read the label wrong in the product, in my bad. Uh, group, uh, everything works fine. So to top the line by, in open communities, it is a cultural norm for even project leaders and really senior contributors to ask, quote, unquote, stupid questions in public. So, you know, the leader of Fedora, which reaches millions of downloads every time it releases, came on and went, so I'm trying to learn Python, really, really basic programming. Have questions. Help, please. And it's sort of awe inspiring for students to see people that they respect a lot ask questions that they themselves might be asking. So I, I often model these behaviors when students have a hard time communicating. I just say, if you're sending here, let's send an email. Let's go on to this online chat. Hey, is so and so here? And then they reply. And then we ask for a question. Say, there you go, you just talked to the project lead. They live in Australia. They answered your question. Um, we have to be bold. I took part in an editing project on a book project on a wiki. It was the most bizarre thing I had done for a long time because nobody cared what I edited in a book that would be written collaboratively. That's not how books are written. That's not how books are written, right? It's bad enough trying to write it with someone else, right? Like, ah, right? Uh, it was just, it was amazing. People saying, yeah, I did anything. Just do it. Go. And bringing people to the party. When we show up with 30 students, we turn them loose to add value. That's pretty cool. They can be test. Uh, so let's just rapid fire through the list and let's wrap up. So there are a bunch of resources that we can talk about in terms of how to find larger umbrella organizations that want to bridge the gap between the academic and open source communities and so help facilitate that kind of matching up. There are workshops for faculty, so people running workshops for students in terms of here come for the weekend, we're going to bootstrap you up with the knowledge of the tools you're going to need and make some introductions so you can get to know who you should be asking questions of. Uh, so there are people out there doing this kind of thing, there are people out there trying to help you do this kind of thing, not just you know you going by yourself. And in terms of, you know, maybe I'll write a grant. You have you have some very easy ones available to you. Um, the New Directions Initiative and the GLCA. <laughs> <laughs> right, that email you deleted a few weeks ago saying deadlines yeah, are coming yeah. up. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think they're one thousand to six thousand dollars or something like that. Um, and so, for example, you know, if you wanted to work with Mel, or if you said Mel, who might be particularly good in this space? being able to write a grant that might bring them and spend a day or two collaborating, or perhaps bringing faculty from several institutions together and spending a day or two doing this. Um, these are the kind of workshops I've been taking part in, and they've been really great because they connect me with other educators who are passionate about that kind of thing. Um, and at least the message on our campus was New Directions money, we need to spend it, send us proposals. So if you're interested in doing these kind of things, we're happy to talk more about it, and there's easy ways to get a launch out of it. <laughs> and so in more terms important of, than that, it's not just one. Uh, <laughs> and in terms of some examples of institutions that are already doing this, and things that are not necessarily technology, right? There are people at Harvard studying this from a legal perspective, licensing, creative commons, what does it mean, uh, what are the implications, and, and across countries, how does it, how does it vary? So those are the programs at RIT. How do we make uh, students technologically fluent in terms of being able to be freelancers instead of working for that publication? What technology do they need to use? What do they need to be able to understand? They need to be able to dive into transcripts and chat logs and, and figure out what's going on. Uh, first year seminar, similar to the one that Matt taught at Allegheny, using that again as here is a community of people, here's how to learn to be bold and become part of it because one of the things that students are in business to do is we're conditioned to be really when people tell us to be creative under these specifications. And then we become creative in a still box. But turning that into having your mind stand for opportunities by default and then take them without someone explicitly telling you here's an opportunity to take it. And having that mindset of you should be taking initiative continuously when you can. That's sort of a cultural mindset that you can try and instill in students by putting them in the midst of a community who would have you thought is that? Um, anthropology discussed before about the, the data being open for analysis, and there's 
a whole bunch of others uh, and then have people have people who might have been doing the same If you go to teachingopensource.org, we have a fairly low traffic mailing list, but uh, it's a nice place to find community of educators who are engaging these kind of questions. Um, in theory, that resource is actually supposed to move at some point in the future to uh, me. That's right. Um, but uh, the point is, is that it's a community of educators working to do this. And uh, at the end of the day, what we've, what we've gone through here is, is high level and fast. And our hope is that primarily that this starts a conversation. Um, we've established the Center for Innovative Pedagogy. Um, at some level, all we're, what we've been able to say is we can brainstorm in a short period of time ideas that just begin to scratch the surface of opportunities for our students. And we haven't even really dug into what are some of the real implications for us in terms of our teaching. But I think there's actually a world of opportunity out there, and there's not, you know, an opportunity for me to share some of those experiences, even in brief. Um, so, uh, we're reachable online. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we'll be, here the, be here for the rest of the evening. Um, Mel is here all day. Tomorrow, if you have any interest in meeting up with her, um, I'd recommend that you go to the uh, Coral Concert tomorrow evening, as I recommend to all of you. Um, but uh, Carrie and I have to go back to our own community choir concert, so we will not be around. I'm always happy to talk more about it. We'll close with any questions and thank you. <laughs> so I've been involved a little bit in a sort of mass collaboration on the experimental side of chemistry, and I'm also part of a group that is a collaboration of faculty to develop resources. Something that I always run up against is that I love this idea, but it seems to fly in the face of the reward system in academics and if this were in the private sector, right? Giving away your services is <laughs> not how a business can run. I mean, it's not the reward. I mean, academics, we reward expertise, and when everything is shared, how do you justify your position? I heard you allude to it throughout your talk. Could you maybe talk a little bit more about is that a major roadblock or is that surmounted? I've, I've heard people caution me, especially as a junior member of the faculty, with respect to this kind of by caution. Matt, don't do this. <laughs> um, so there's two things there, um, institutional reward system and also a, a little bit from the, the corporate side. Uh, there are companies that do a lot of work in the open source space. Red Hat is one of them, IBM, Google. Now, a lot of these are closed core, open shell. Red Hat aspires to be very open from the core. What that, but by that, though, I mean, uh, for example, Red Hat employs many full-time engineers to work on Fedora, which is completely free and open. And after a period of time, several revisions of the software, it becomes their core enterprise product, which they then come to institutions like Kenyon and say, what do you run on your servers? Why don't you run Linux? We will sell you support. So they sell the support. Um, and they broke it into the S&P 500 on that. So they're a billion dollar a year tech company. Paying engineers to give away code. But you pay for Google services. Right? We don't pay a lot for Google services, but every time you check your email, you pay for it. Yeah. They monetize advertising the way that no one else did. So that one's. Uh, but the, the reward system is really complex. Some disciplines are starting to reward data sets and citations to them, but that, of course, implies that we want to count citations. Uh, we want to that. Um, no. um, even if your local institution says, we think this is marvelous, but no other institution around you says that, arguably you could be hurting your ability to go you know, on to move because now you've invested your career in the local system, which is not in keeping with the rest of the community. Um, at some level, one answer, so one answer I have is, well, I love to see your faculty help lead the way. And if we're going to, if we want to develop, if we want, it's a question. 
We want to develop a culture of openness in academia. We want to develop a culture of sharing in the work that we do. Do you ask your youngest faculty to do it, or do you do it to your senior faculty to do it? How would your practice change if every single thing you did went into a blog that everyone in the world could read today? Um. I don't, um, so I don't, I don't have, it's a, it is a hard question. In computer science, to a certain extent, we've been working this way for a long time. There are plenty of research programs that are built on large open source projects, OpenMP, which is a library for clustering. Uh, LAM MPI is currently hosted at Indiana University. It pulls in plenty of NSF and corporate grants to support PhD students doing research in networking and cluster work. And everything in that group is open. But it also becomes the scaling question. The point that you are the managers of that project, who else is going to start another project that's the same? I was going to add a slightly more optimistic and perhaps naive perspective on that. Which is, so, um, if your work is out in the open, then it's, it's something you can point to and say, look, I did this on the state, this is my work. It is something that it's easier for other people to pick up and build upon, and you can point to that and say, look at how many people my work has impacted. And it's not just in terms of citations, also. Right? Uh, little out of the world started in the University in Italy. Now they're being used in classes to do physical computing all across the world. And that's not necessarily lots of academic citations, but if you can point to millions of people around the world using your project, and they all know it came from your institution, like the Berkeley database, it has the word Berkeley in the back. So that's, that's a brand building thing as well. And, uh, I don't think it's impossible, but it's just difficult. How do you do things like design and beauty? It's sort of what you're talking about. Can be the responses to your question. To kind of the, the flip side of that, that's kind of the, the iceberg on the faculty side. Perhaps the iceberg on the student side is uh, an issue around student privacy. And uh, this is in part motivated by the fact that um, Georgia Tech recently um, unilaterally took down their entire wiki project um, because they were concerned that the evidence that a student had participated in the class wiki constituted a class record, constituted a FERPA violation, constituted an oh my god, we gotta get sued! And they uh, saw, and their reaction, uh, the top-down state institution, was shut it down. Um, I'm probably told the room what I think of that decision, but <laughs> I do respect that there is an issue there about students who may have a wish to either be private or to have some control over their enduring presence on the web. And I'm wondering how we can think about those. Um, this recently came up on the teaching open source mailing list, actually. Uh, in the wake of that, somebody said, oh, what's going to happen? And uh, my expensive, expensive background law, I was fine. <laughs> but I went, uh, I knew that at the upcoming faculty meeting, all of our FERPA rules were about to be reviewed, so I went and looked at the slide deck that the registrar had circulated. And I read through it and I said, well, if you give the students the opportunity to opt out, they are of the age majority. Now there's all kinds of power issues. The professor says we're doing this project and we're going to be working online. The student may feel they have to do it. There's all kinds of subtle complexities. But at the end of the day, if you say, if you feel uncomfortable with this or there's some reason that you don't feel you can do this, you should talk to me. And a student comes up to you and says, for a variety of reasons, I really don't feel comfortable with this. They say, well, if I, if I gave you a, a, a pseudonym, would you be willing? And they say, no. And you say, okay. Uh, how about if you write this paper instead? <clears throat> and so they, they get a different experience, and maybe that somehow it, it, it's a reality. But they are, that same student probably has pictures of himself with red plastic cups on his book. So, <laughs> I, but they are, at some level, we have to treat them as well. And there are also many other participations that don't require you to use a lack of the right? You are analyzing transcripts and that. 
So if you were just looking at a chat room or reading homework and looking at it with your lab partner, you don't need the email, you don't need to put your name out there. So a giant chunk of these activities don't even touch that boundary because you're using material. And that's, you know, putting that out. Got some comments? 